My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to Grey Mirror, a podcast from MIT Media Lab's Digital Currency Initiative on technology, society, and ethics. And unlike something like Black Mirror, which just looks at the negative impacts of technology on society, we are Grey Mirror, so we look at the positive and negative impacts of technology on society. And please, if you have any feedback, reach out on Twitter. And if you like the show, give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. Uh, We really do appreciate it. Thanks. Hello, everybody. So today I interview Kelsey Piper, who's a journalist at Future Perfect, which is this effective altruist-inspired publication from Vox. And we have a wide-ranging discussion, as one does on podcasts, you know, uh, about a variety of different things, um, what it's like to write about effective altruist stuff for a general audience, uh, which, by the way, as a side note here, it's just so cool that there's now a real um, thing, i.e. Vox, uh, that has that talks about effective altruist stuff and is effective altruist inspired. I think that's good for society. I'm not saying all effective, uh, or all media outlets should be effective altruist inspired, but just have a couple feels fine. Um, so we chat about that, we chat about her article about you know, climate change and why it's not an, uh, an actual existential risk, but it's obviously a big risk, but why that uh, differentiation is important. Um, we chat about the norms around the safe release of uh, GPT-2, which is an AI uh, language uh, generating software. Uh, but I want to kind of highlight two big points here. The first is um, we chat about social justice activism versus effective altruism as mindsets um, and why they are sometimes compatible, sometimes not compatible. And I think Kelsey makes two pretty uh, cool points about this. The first is that with social justice activism, they're very suspicious of people speaking on others' behalf. Um, and, and they put a lot of weight, social justice activists put a lot of weight on people's lived experience. Um, and that's all reasonable and very powerful. Where it's like, eh, speaking if someone else is like, it's like a neocolonialist vibe where you're like, oh, I think that these, I know what's best for these people, therefore I speak for them. Um, and that's generally good to be wary of those things. But for things like animals or for future people who can't speak for themselves, then how should that be part of the social justice activist lens or the mindset there? Um, and then the other piece here is, you know, the social justice activist perspective on systems of oppression and power, which again is a very powerful perspective. It's kind of a justice oriented perspective where you say, oh boy, there are these like bad people in power and they're doing these bad things um, and they're being oppressive or they're using their power in bad ways and we want justice. Um, And so this has worked for a while in terms of pushing back on past problems like slavery or um, the, you know, prison pipeline or whatever. But It's difficult to have that similar perspective with um, things like AI safety or other existential kind of exponential risks where there's no real bad actor. There's no real injustice that's happening. It's just kind of it's Moloch, right? It's it's incentives gone wrong um, with just well-intentioned people trying to do their their best and even if everybody's well intentioned and thinking from a good you know justice framework it still might not work and you know uh, many people may die from some of these things so yeah this is to say that um social justice activism it's really good at looking at the system and how power and oppression work within the system but it's probably less good when looking at how incentives or technology work within the system so this is to say that whenever you're putting on a uh, hat or lens or a perspective whether it's effective altruist or social justice activism um think about what problems does does it make legible? Um, which ones can it see? And then which ones is it not as good as at, at, at tackling or which ones are, is it less good at exploring? So uh, that's the first big point here. And then the second big point is um, around what Kelsey calls mimetic immunity uh, and what I'm going to call cultural evolution. And the macro point here is, you know, Kelsey and I were talking about GPT-2, which is this, you know, a GAN for text instead of for images. So you can feed it a bunch of text and then it will generate a bunch of new text. And it's a powerful piece of technology that OpenAI developed that um, they're kind of worried about, so they didn't release it. And, you know, we chat about the norms around and, and the ways to combat something like GPT-2. Um, and we were chatting about, hey, what if we just have computers that can spot the fake GPT-2 text? And I was like, eh, that's just an arms race. Can't we upgrade humans instead? And Kelsey's response to that pushback was, you know, we have something called like mimetic immunity here where um, 
you know, for example, old people um, get scammed over email by various folks, but young people, we're kind of used to it. And we say, eh, we, we know what to expect there, and we're not going to click on those links. And so we can kind of recognize the scams. And she calls this mimetic immunity, where, um, you know, the humanity and the population over time kind of gets immune to some kind of new meme that exists in the world, some new idea. And I would call this cultural evolution, uh, and that's from this book, Secrets of Our Success, by anthropologist Joseph Heinrich. And the idea behind cultural evolution is that Homo sapiens are successful not just because of, you know, what we've, not just because of our big brains, but because of what we've been able to pass down from generation to generation and what we can teach our kids with our big, big brains. So it's like when our kids are born, we teach them all of the cultural stuff and evolution that has happened over time so that they can succeed in society and in the world. And so that's this idea of, of cultural evolution. And you can pretty much see that um, here with tech, where it's like when this new tech thing pops up, um, in addition to maybe responding with code or with laws or whatever, you can also respond from this cultural evolution or mimetic uh, immunity perspective where you say, hey, these things might be initially hurtful to society and humanity, but we're going to kind of, as a population, be, be able to reject them or get immunity to them or evolve new cultural norms around them that are uh, more beneficial for us um, and society. So that's the idea here. And I guess the question for you as the, the listener is to say, hey, whenever there's a new technology coming out, you know, how can we use, um, in addition to other mechanisms like code and law, how can we use cultural evolution to maximize societal benefit? That's kind of the, the macro question here. So this is to say, it's a fun conversation with Kelsey. Uh, we chat about a variety of things around effective altruism and media and tech and all these things. So enjoy today's episode. Goodbye. Hello, everyone. You're listening to Gray Mirror. Today, I'm excited to interview Kelsey Piper, a journalist at Future Perfect, which is an effective altruist-inspired publication from Vox. Uh, Kelsey, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm excited to ch- to dive in. Um, it's one of my, I get 10 newsletters a week and Future Perfect one is one of them. And honestly, I love it. <laughs> so what, um, before kind of diving into some of the specific articles you've written, I want to kind of stay at the meta level a bit at the start and think about, you know, your audience and thinking about, because there hasn't been really a uh, effective altruist aligned um, media thing as far as I know, in the past at all. So I, I want to kind of explore that. So at a, first, at a high level, who do you see as the um, future, per- the audience of Future Perfect? So I think there are some effective altruist ideas that have inherently a pretty small audience, um, you know, either because they're so complicated to become competent with and really understand the argument for, or just because they're on something really weird that most people don't care about, like, um, and maybe that'll change 20 years from now, but it's not going to change tomorrow. But then there are a lot of effective altruist ideas that I think are very broadly applicable tools for thinking about the world, being outcome-oriented in evaluation of programs and political ideas and things like that, being focused on whether the things you're doing are going to have the desired results and willing to draw them and do something different if they're not. Um, and I think, therefore, the there's a sense in which the audience for a lot of effective altruist ideas is everybody who cares about making the world better and is interested in how people are going about that. And I think Future Perfect is very much aimed at that audience, um, just talking about efforts that are being made, what we can learn from them, how they're going, um, and then also introducing some of the more esoteric ideas um, and sort of trying to bring those into the mainstream conversation and make them more something that everyone can participate in. Yeah, that's interesting. So it sounds like it is it's designed for a general audience. I, it's not just like another like small effective altruist kind of niche thing. Given that, how you know what is it like for you in terms of translating some of the um, translating or choosing some of the effective altruist ideas and then presenting them for a more general audience? How do you how do you think about that process? So I think that most ideas can be communicated to a broad audience. I think sometimes it's very challenging and it requires a lot of intermediate work to introduce you know stepstone ideas and sort of help people have all the tools they need to interpret an idea within the worldview it makes sense within. Like you can't always just throw an idea out there without a lot of ground 
work to make it make sense. Um, but I do think that if you do that groundwork, people are broadly intellectually curious. People are broadly intrigued by new ways of seeing the world. Um, and a lot of people will stick with you as you try and lay out something complicated and sort of outside their wheelhouse. Um, and I think Vox tries to market itself to an audience of like, um, educated Americans who are interested in learning the real story behind the news. Um, the the tagline is explaining the news, right? Um, and so it's a sort of natural fit for that project. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess, have you, for something like, you know, artificial intelligence safety, which is a, uh, you know, more difficult to understand and explain kind of concept. I know you wrote um, a relatively uh, large article about that recently. How, you know, what were some of the stepstone ideas that you had to put in there, things like that, in order to get folks more generally to understand? Hmm. So stepstone ideas for caring about AI. One, I think, is caring about existential risk and like the idea that human extinction is an extremely bad outcome that we should be highly motivated to prevent. Uh, I actually run into a lot of people who are just very unpersuaded of this and it me creates this disconnect in talking about anything like AI. You know, some of them will express sentiments like, well, we had our run on Earth, like time for something <laughs> else, um, you know, or... Yeah, I'm sure something's going to kill us this century, so I don't really care what it is. Um, and that that was very unfamiliar to me. Uh, you know, I, I have kids. I am very much planning to not let the world go extinct. <laughs> I, I don't even sort of consider this debatable. No, it wouldn't be better if everybody were dead. People are good and their lives are good and their goals are good. Um, but I think that's not universal. And one of the conversations you have to have is this is why yes, the world is worth saving. And yes, the world is possible to save. We're not just on this path to inevitable destruction. Um, so can I, can I dive in on that for a second? Because I think yeah. that's really interesting. And I, I, I hear that as well. Sometimes you're like, look, we don't want the world to die. And they're like, look, if humans kill the world, then like, it was our fault. And we should, you know, uh, yeah. it's our <laughs> too bad, but we were bad for the world. So we it's bad to us. Do you think I think that's also a natural response to in terms of when you think about, um, there's this nice article that I like from someone called Managing Planetary Collapse, uh, which is, it, it has this weird construct of like, if we if we do have existential risk or there is planetary collapse, then how can we manage it? And it's, it can be stressful um, to think about these really big problems that we have. And then to think it, it's an easier response to be like, oh, I can't even control them. And so whatever happens, happens versus like, oh no, we can like take the little steps we need to in order to like try to help. So I think, I think there's almost an emotional response there too, which is like, oh God, if these things are happening, then we're kind of screwed anyways. And I don't, I don't know what to do about that. Yeah. I think that's part of it. It's so big. It's so terrifying and people don't, don't have good ways to deal with. This is big and terrifying and probably you can't influence it, but there are small things you could do that, that have an off chance of mattering somehow and you should do them because it's that important. That's not a very natural mode of thinking. I think it's much easier to just abstract away from all of the deaths and all of the horrors that would be involved in the apocalypse and be like, well, you know, if it happens, we had it coming, which is just not true. It's just absolutely not true. Um, yeah. But but it's appealing in that way because then it's not something that you have to dedicate yourself to trying to somehow address. Yeah. Do you think that there's a, and this kind of gets into a topic that we're going to chat about later as well, which is in terms of getting people to care about existential risk, uh, you have this great line at the end of one of your uh, posts that says, you know, you're talking about foundations and you say they rely on private donors attempting to help a constituency that can't vote and can't protest our descendants. Um, and I agree with that. It's uh, <laughs> if you think, you know, future people um, don't have any uh, say in what happens to them. Uh, and so I'm, I'm reminded of um, Rob Reich's uh, recent book, Just Giving, and how they talk about intergenerational justice um, mm -hmm. and and thinking about uh, presentism, that our, our government institutions have presentism to combine with them. I think this gets into this kind of juicy category around things where like effective altruism is on one side and something like social justice activism is on the other side. And they're both obviously very true, but thinking about ways to make them more legible to each other, stuff like presentism or intergenerational justice or, you know, kind of more the aggressive ones of something like future lives matter or something like that might be ways to kind of talk in the same language. What, what, do, you, what do you think about this general intersection and how to make, um, <laughs> how to make it a beneficial intersection? 
seems really hard. Um, yeah, my, my off the cuff instinct in response to that, and it isn't something I've thought about very much, is that uh, a lot of what social justice has done um, in terms of its actual practical approach to solving problems is trying to center the voices of people experiencing the problems. A lot of the social justice approach to thinking about a question, you know, what characterizes it distinctly as opposed to other approaches is ask the people involved, listen to the people involved, um, let this be a conversation guided by the people affected. And I think that has a lot of benefits. I think that's certainly a perspective that was missing from a lot of conversations. And a lot of what made social justice powerful was giving people the sense, oh, I am an expert on my experiences. I have the right to be in this conversation about them and to be leading this conversation about them. And that was obviously a like tremendously appealing idea to a lot of people. Um, but I do think that it creates this deficiency where social justice as a community struggles to deal with any issue, which doesn't have people right there sort of ready to speak about their own experiences and contextualize their own experiences. And I think people are aware of this deficiency. I think certainly I'm not saying anything that people involved in social justice would disagree with, um, but it makes it really hard to sort of orient that approach to thinking about the world towards any problem that that doesn't have voices you can elevate because they don't exist yet. And that doesn't have like I, I think social justice is institutionally very suspicious of people speaking on other people's behalf about what they want and what it's like to do right by them. And I, I think that's a justified suspicion in a lot of cases. But you know, for people who don't exist yet, or for animals who are being tortured but can't talk about it, or for anything like that, I, I don't know what you do, because it seems bad to exclude from the conversation anyone who can't voice their own interests in it. But also, I do understand that suspicion that people trying to talk on other people's behalf are going to get some important things wrong. Yeah, I think I, I like both of those a lot. Um, a, the kind of lived experience perspective um, and, and how that that's a crucial piece into these conversations. And I, I would kind of contrast that with something that I think social justice activists also have, which is like the ideas of systemic oppression and power structures and things like that, which is maybe more aligned with an abstract perspective. Um, and then on the other side, as you said, the, you know, being suspicious of folks, you know, talking on others behalf it's like yeah that's a good reason to be suspicious and um uh, for folks yeah animals or future people it's like someone if no one speaks for them then no one speaks for them that's just <laughs> they can't speak for themselves so that seems tough mm -hmm. yeah do you think that there's i mean do you think i mean the systemic oppression piece do you, do you think that that is kind of maybe more aligned with an ea perspective or something like that mm -hmm. so I think there are obviously tools in that framework that are usable um, for thinking about EA stuff, um, but there's also a couple places where that framework and EA frameworks are in tension. Um, one is that justice-oriented uh, ethical systems tend to care a lot about the source of harms, and in particular whether the source of harms was someone behaving culpably or not. Um, and I think a lot of the harms that we're facing today that EAs are most concerned with are not harms caused by someone behaving culpably. Um, like, for example, a lot of the ways the future can go bad are not anybody like maliciously acting or anybody like acting to systemically harm the interests of future people. Like, one big way we could all go extinct is if we are trying to do the right thing for future people and we screw up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think justice-oriented uh, ways of thinking, just that is less the sort of problem that they're equipped to reason about. Um, like, it does seem like there's a lot to draw from that to reason about, like, factory farming, why is it happening? Um, or maybe even climate change, why is it not being addressed fast enough? Like, I think you can meaningfully answer those questions by saying, like, the powerful people want it, the people who are being harmed by it don't have the power to end it. Like, that's what's going on there, and you're not missing something important by saying that. But yeah, if, if, if you're looking at something like artificial intelligence, intelligence, um, then I think that that approach just is missing something very important, which is like an account of um, an account of how we don't need an injustice 
to get a very, very bad mm. outcome. We don't mm. need to be doing something culpably wrong to get a very, very bad outcome. We don't need any bad guys or anybody who is not adequately prioritizing everybody else. We can have a balanced committee of people from every walk of life and perspective and every like way of looking at the world, and we can all die because that that balanced set of perspectives didn't happen to include the correct answer to how do we do this right yeah i think that i like i like i think that that's a good way to think about this which is these especially yeah that the that the social justice activist perspective is yeah is focused on justice and and that's been traditionally i mean it's 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 the that mindset was the result of all of our past um where we were doing things that were in the case that problems are (laughs) caused by injustices this is not like something that's getting drawn out of a hat Um, exactly exactly yeah and that we had things like I was going to say we had things like slavery and things of that for, that were like okay this was bad per you know doing bad uh, but as we go further into the future with exponential technology and things like yeah it's like yeah it's like yeah it's less the bad guy thing it's more like the crisis is in the system um, and so uh, trying to to deal with that from a justice oriented mindset is tough um, okay cool so I did, thank you for exploring that with me I thought that was interesting um, I think I want to I want to stay at the meta level for a bit here um, as well t- talking about like media and 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 uh, the first effective altruist aligned outlet. Um, and I think the traditional story here is something like, hey, you can't make money talking about important things. Um, you need outrage, you know, you need clickbait, you need things like that. Um, but you all exist, obviously, as an organization. I know you're, to some extent, nonprofit um, funded. How do you kind of balance, um, you know, the clickbait uh, engagement side with, you know, actual impact? So yeah, Future Perfect is funded by a grant and we don't have to worry about whether we're making enough money through page views to pay our salaries. I think this actually only like 20% reduces the incentives to have tons of page views because the thing about clickbait and page views is that page views aren't just like a way of getting money. They're also a sign of whether anybody's reading what you wrote, right? And like, that's very motivating. Like, even if I, my salary and my job security don't depend at all on whether people are reading what I write, I want people to read what I write. I recently wrote a piece about climate, um, that, that sort of explored whether it's an existential risk, um, and more than half a million people read it. And, you know, a week before that, I wrote a piece about vaccination and the effort to create vaccines that uh, don't need to be refrigerated, which will make them much cheaper to distribute in developing countries, and 10,000 people read it. And even if I don't have any external incentives there. Certainly there's a part of me when I'm thinking what to write about next, that's like, wow, if I write about like climate change and the end of humanity, you know, I'm going to get half a million people to read this and be influenced by it and talk about it and think about it. And if I write about vaccination, which is an equally important issue, I would say, if we successfully develop vaccines that don't need to be refrigerated, it's going to save tons of lives. It's a big deal no one's going to read it. And, and that doesn't yeah. affect you because you're a journalist because you want to be heard. You want people to, to learn this stuff. Yeah. So do you, so that makes sense. And I think, I mean, maybe another way to say this is there's also the traditional version of media, which is what shows up in my Facebook feed or on my Twitter versus maybe the hyper effective ultras version of media, which is, it tells me every day that like what the current, you know, parts per million of, um, you know, the CO2 in the atmosphere is, you know, how many people were saved, how many kids died before the age of five in various poor countries, how many people were saved by malaria or whatever. Like, so I think that there's, and I don't see that much of like the latter one with the stuff that you all are doing, things that were, are like, hey, here's important stuff that you should know that's not really news, but we just want to like repeat it over and over again because it's important. Is there maybe room for that? Hmm. So I don't know that that's a... I, I think here's today's CO2 levels doesn't feel to me like something that, like, we want people to have enough context to interpret anything that's said. Um, so I feel like probably the ideal effect of altruist media, and that's certainly not future perfect. Future perfect is a combination of lots of different things, and it's certainly not, I wouldn't say it's even an attempt, and it's certainly not, you know, six months into existing, have already succeeded yeah. at being the perfect effect of altruist media. That's the only thing you'll ever need. Um, but I think if that existed, what I would expect it to look like is um, 
uh, important news reported in proportion to how important it is and contextualized so that when you read it, you have a full understanding of why it is as important as it is and like what information is new in it and what information is just a broad overview of our current understanding of the field. Um, so you would maybe have every six months updates on the global warming situation that would contextualize all of the uh, events that had happened in the last six months by how important they were and just discard anything that was like sounded interesting and wasn't actually important. Um, you know, out of respect for people's time. So that's sort of what I would imagine from that ideal, like, effective altruist media. Um, and, and that's not super what we're doing, but I think we want to be doing things more in that genre than not, you know, when we can, um, is providing regular updates that offer useful context on everything. Yeah, I like that. I, and I think of it as kind of like, uh, you know, sense making for humanity or whatever. It's like, what should we all be thinking about? Okay, here's the six month update or your quarterly update on where we are with climate change. Yeah, um, I think that, that makes sense. I also think there's some room for like this weird idea of just like repeating, like in companies, often you have like your KPIs, and you just like repeat the thing that should be repeated over and over again. I think that it was less clear how that would work out, though. Let, and let me ask you one one final question on this media piece, which is, to some extent, you all might be in a good... I think that effective altruism doesn't talk that much about um, the kind of uh, media landscape more generally and polarization and uh, the attention economy and surveillance capitalism and, and things of that mm -hmm. variety. And I think that for you all being kind of... Uh, and those things are important from a, a sense-making. Oh, they're yeah. not fully prioritized within EA, but from a sense-making perspective, I think they're important. What do you think about that world and, and maybe uh, your specific media, um, being in media, your, your mindset towards that? Yeah, I think that is an important question. I think that uh, there's lots, one of the ways in which Future Perfect is not an effective altruist outlet, it's like an effective altruist aligned outlet, is that it's very interested in questions that seem like important questions for our society to answer, even if there's not an effective altruist like angle on them, because there's maybe not an effective way on the margin to change um, whatever it is that needs to change. Um, and I, I think that the, that's certainly one of them. And certainly one thing I end up covering a lot is um, stories like, how did the media get this wrong? Or what went wrong in order to cause this fake statistic to spread so widely? Or how would this approach to like improving reporting work? Um, and I think that's also very much in our wheelhouse, just because uh, it seems like something that as a society, we're going to have to get right at some point, and we don't really know how yet. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's my instinct as well. That there's and there's something about being in the belly of the beast that allows you to uh, to do it, and it's kind of connected to the page views piece as well. Where it's like if you imagine a fully uh, whatever media looks like in the future, if you can make yourself look as much like it as possible, that would be cool or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. That does seem so like a good ambition to me. Nice. Yeah, sweet. We're aligned. Um, so let's let's dive into some of your recent articles because uh, a lot of them were pretty fascinating. I think let's start with um, the one that you referenced earlier. The um, the title of it is pretty pretty good. It's will Cli climate change kill everyone or just lots and lots of people? Um, and this is a key concept within effect altruism, which is the difference between a global catastrophic risk, uh, which is non existential, and an, a, an actual existential risk, which is one where if everybody dies, then all the future people don't get to live as well, um, which is even worse. And so, and you kind of go into the article about the difference between two degrees Celsius versus three or four degrees Celsius, um, those kind of amounts of warming for the world. Um, and I guess maybe my macro question here is pretty much the title of your article. So will it kill everybody, climate change, or just lots and lots of people? So my understanding is that there is no plausible scenario by which climate change is an existential risk. This is not counting things like, because of climate change, there are like, mass displaced populations and then this like increases tensions and then because of those people have a nuclear war that kind of thing is much harder to um evaluate in a lot of ways um although i think if you're looking at things that increase tensions and lead to nuclear war uh desperate conditions in poor countries is I'm not sure that it is one of the ones that you would come up with if you were from scratch mm -hmm. trying to come with a list of all the situations that might lead to nuclear war. I think a, a lot of specific scenarios in the countries that are um, 
nuclear powers and the tensions that exist between them would probably come up first. Uh, so I sort of wonder if when people say, oh yeah, well, climate change could cause tensions between countries and then there could be a nuclear war. I kind of wonder if they arrived at that by listing the most plausible scenarios for nuclear war and finding that high on the list or by like trying to think about ways that climate change could still kill us all. Um, hmm. But anyway, there's that sort of scenario. But in terms of direct effects, the planet will not be uninhabitable after four degrees of warming. The planet will probably not, according to the people I've talked to who looked into this more than me, be uninhabitable after 10 degrees of warming. Like, don't get me wrong. 10 degrees Celsius of warming would be the, the biggest nightmare in human history. It would be awful. Uh, the parts of the planet that could sustain a civilization basically like the ones we have now would be much smaller um, and tons and tons of people would die in the transition. But human civilization in basically its present form could exist with 10 degrees of warming. And 10 degrees of warming is basically impossible, to be clear. There's like no real reasonable scenario, even if we like keep increasing our CO2 emissions and do absolutely nothing and don't care about any of this. It's still not clear how we would possibly successfully emit enough carbon to raise temperatures 10 degrees. If we were actively trying to do that, if for some reason we needed to raise temperatures 10 degrees to survive as a civilization, I don't think we could do it. 10 degrees <laughs> is that much. So... Directly speaking, climate change is not going to be an existential risk. And the reason that this is like sort of not been said <coughs> as much as I think is appropriate is that um, people don't want to, you know, basically go for, oh, this isn't a big deal. You know, that's a perspective that's associated with, you know, a climate denialist population that's, you know, misrepresenting science and seems pretty motivated to ignore the the deaths of tens of millions or hundreds of millions of people in foreign countries that aren't here. And so I think there's a very much an aversion to being part of that crowd and being associated with that. Um, and that aversion might explain uh, some of the some of the reaction there, um, some of the reluctance to say, nope, this is going to be bad, but it is not in fact going to kill us all. Like, even though my understanding is that that's definitely the consensus position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, um, and that's a, as I agree with that, that like, it, it's a classic kind of, to some extent, like a Mott Bailey thing where you're like, where you say, Hey, Oh, like, I think that, you know, climate change is not actually an existential risk and that, and then people are like, what do you mean? You don't care about it? Like, are you not a vegetarian or whatever? You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, <laughs> uh, and so I think that there's a, especially, yeah, when you, you get, you can get bucketed easily into the two big groups of climate change denier versus climate change believer. Um, in fact, there's a lot of texture there. Um, I think that there's, and, and obviously it requires also the difference between a global catastrophic risk, i.e. hundreds of millions of people dying versus an X risk, an X central risk which is everybody dying and that's tell me a difference little bit more that seems so callous to people like i think yeah. a lot of people when you try to draw a distinction they're assuming that you're trying to draw the distinction to say one of these isn't a big deal and so even saying yes it will be a catastrophic risk but it won't be an existential risk you know it comes across as saying like sure hundreds of millions of people will die but you know they're poor mm -hmm. they're far away you know it is very hard to say it does matter the distinction does matter to us between a global catastrophic risk and an existential risk, but that is not because a global catastrophic risk isn't bad. Like you will not find an effective altruist who, who wouldn't die in a heartbeat to stop climate change because it is that big a deal because hundreds of millions of people dying does matter. It's just, there, there are important differences in our strategic response between a GCR and an X risk. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that, in, in fact, it's the opposite where it's like, be, it's because they care, because folks care more um, is, in fact, why that they're making that distinction. Because, yeah, mm -hmm. because then it changes the strategic uh, possibilities of, of, oh, how should we prioritize things here? So, um, yeah, I think that there's one, one other question on this, which is, I mean, the, the two degrees Celsius versus in the article, there was a lot about like, OK, are we going to be on a two degrees Celsius thing or is it going to be a three or four degrees Celsius? And like the, the differences there. 
Could you tell me a little bit about like what it looks like it's going to happen and, and what that means for humanity? Yeah. So my impression, and this is, I am not a scientist. I am reporting the scientific consensus as people who are scientists have explained it to me. But yeah, I definitely want your listeners to be clear on that. My impression is that we should expect more than two degrees of warming unless something like surprisingly fortunate happens. Like it turns out to be very easy to suck a lot of carbon out of the atmosphere and the transition to electrical power uh, goes fast faster and better than expected. Um, on default trajectories where nothing, you know, sort of miraculously fortunate like that happens, then we're probably going to see more than two degrees of warming. We might see three. Um, if things go quite poorly, we might see four. Um, and the IPCC has sort of created some confusion here because they've been very focused on the target of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees C. Um, and they have like invited lots of scientists to uh, sort of participate in the conversation about how do we stay at 1.5 degrees C. And so there's tons of literature out here focused on the question of how do we stay at 1.5 degrees C. And that's not an environment that's very conducive to saying, you know, looks like we're not going to stay at 1.5 degrees C. Uh, here's what we're actually probably going to do. Um, and so I think that at this point, a lot of people feel like the, the 1.5 degree C conversation is, is a little bit of a distraction um, and is maybe misleading people about the actual range of scenarios we're facing. Um, and that, that's actually some of what creates fertile ground for these apocalyptic, the world is going to end conversations. Because if everybody kind of agrees that the scientific consensus is missing some important points, then it's, of course, much, much easier to believe, um, you know, claims that that we're all going to die because once you've decided, okay, the IPCC is being too optimistic, then I think there's a lot of range for interpretation and a lot of people's interpretations are more pessimistic than, than the evidence justifies. Um, yeah. 1.5 is, is it, it does not seem at all plausible to me that we'll succeed at 1.5. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, um, uh, so yeah, so it's, yeah, not 1.5, even though know, that's what the IPCC is saying. And it's going to be almost certainly above two um, and likely closer to three. And if things go kind of poorly, it's going to be four. Um, and that and having that in your mind is just nice. Like it's going to be two to three degrees um, and, and two to three degrees Celsius. And, and that is kind of a, a backdrop. I think there's a there's a bonus question here, which is you're chatting a bit about um, in one of your other articles uh, called The Rise of Meatless Meat uh, Explained. You were chatting about the Impossible Burger and the uh, Beyond Meat Burger. Um, and, you know, this quote here says, hey, um, the Impossible Burger found that, you know, the carbon footprint is, you know, 89% smaller than the burger made from a cow. It uses 87% less water and 96% less land. Um, and I think this is, I just want to, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on this because that's super good. And, and just to be clear to the listeners, I'm a, been a reducitarian slash vegetarian for 10 years. And I used to be it from the perspective of uh, the climate. But then I learned that like you can pay so little money to offset your carbon that you can essentially pay $1 per year. That's the difference of being – you can pay $1 per year to have the same impact, carbon impact um, as a vegetarian uh, versus a meat eater. And so it's like in my mind as much as – and I'm super bullish on the Impossible Burger and I'm super excited by it. And at the same time, I want people to be like actively paying their carbon offsets because you can pay like 10 bucks a year to make it happen. What are your thoughts on something like carbon offsets as a service or like paying off your carbon? So I don't really buy carbon offsets. And my, my reason here is kind of complicated. Um, it, it's not specific to any knowledge of the carbon situation in particular. I have this general heuristic, um, which is mostly from watching GiveWell, which of course evaluates charities and tries to identify the charities that are um, most effective at achieving results with um, money. And a situation that GiveWell runs into a lot is that you do a naive estimate of how much good a charity is doing. Like you figure out how many bed nets they're distributing and how much bed nets reduce malaria. And then as you get more thoughtful and you revise and you add more criteria, almost all of the additional revisions push into the same direction, which is in like decreasing the expected um, gains given a certain amount of money uh, from 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 this intervention um like cost effectiveness estimates tend to get worse and the reason for that is like a bunch of things but uh 
Firstly, if you're looking at something in the first place, you're probably looking at something that stood out as one of the most promising interventions. And if you've got a bunch of noise in your distribution here, then whatever stands out as the most promising is probably less promising than your estimate of its promisingness. Uh, should I expand on that? It's it's a little bit, I, I don't know how much your audience is going to be like, oh yeah, of course that, and how much I should maybe... Uh, ex yeah, explain that a little bit more. The the If you see something that you're excited by, um, it is more like... You say it's more likely that it will it, that your estimate will get worse over time. Yeah, it, it's likely that your estimate was an overestimate. Um, yeah. I don't know. Say, for example, you give a million middle school students a true false quiz um, with very hard questions on it, um, and you pick the most the students who did the best on your true false quiz and are like, these are the most genius middle schoolers in the country. <laughs> well, because uh, you did a million of them and it was a true false quiz, a lot of people were probably up there by absolutely random chance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, if you quiz them again, probably your scores are going to be a lot worse. And some of that is you had a bunch of kids who just got ridiculously lucky. Um, and some of that is even the kids there who were unusually gifted on this one test, probably they were having a really good day. Probably that test is like above average as a representation of their abilities. Um, and the broader principle here is if you have a very noisy way of estimating something, and then you skim off the most promising results of your very noisy estimator, mm -hmm. they're gonna be overestimates. They are almost always going to be overestimates. Um, and this comes up when you're trying to do charity evaluation. It comes up when you're trying to find the most cost-effective way to reduce carbon. So that's one thing. Another thing yep. is failing to sort of take into account trade-offs. Like my, my understanding is that there's a fairly limited amount of opportunities at the um, current prices to reduce carbon. Like there's some rainforest you can save from getting cut down. Um, and there's maybe some land use changes you can prevent. And then we're in the territory of sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere, which is much more expensive than current carbon offset prices, but which is at least scalable. Like at, at that price, you can like continue to pull carbon out of the atmosphere for a long time. But that price is much, much higher than the quoted prices for offsets. Uh, so I have this suspicion that like the land use changes are kind of going to happen anyway, maybe on different timescales. Um, maybe there's some effect, but like probably there's more replaceability there than is being totally accounted for in offsets. Um, and I, I just end up kind of suspecting that our offset numbers, um, and this is also true for like offsetting the animal cruelty of factory farming by donating to factory farming charities. I, I just end up feeling like I bet that our estimates are so wrong that using them to reason about this question is like probably going to confuse me. Um, so a little bit skeptical there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that there's, I mean, the, so your, your first point is the meta point about, hey, if you have, um, if you're getting a noisy estimate about good things, then the things that you thought were good initially, because it was super noisy, oh, turns out a lot of them were not actually that good. Um, and then your second point of uh, diminishing returns, essentially, where we have, we have the cream of the crop uh, CO2 offset things now. And then like, once we, you know, use up all those, if everybody were to actually do this carbon offsetting thing, then we get to things that are a lot more expensive, but are actually scalable, like, you know, sucking CO2 at the atmosphere. Um, I think both of those make sense. I think that I guess I personally am uh, bullish on just the idea that, um, and, and this is, this is, I think a non, this is a heterodox uh, effective altruist idea, which is that individuals should think of themselves as, um, kind of nodes within a system and should try to, um, in addition to thinking about impact oriented metrics for others should also think about, um, themselves and the system and trying to like internalize their externalities and things of that variety. Um, and that money could be a good way to do so and that they should be actively funneling money back to do that. But I, I, I see what you're saying, that, that uh, carbon offsets might be, at least right now, it seems like the, the there hasn't been that much done into them, so it doesn't feel like uh, it's very impactful. Yeah, and I don't have a confident prediction here. I just have a sort of heuristic that produces be suspicious, and so I'm suspicious and sort of mention that. Um, but I, I do think that uh, offsets can be worthwhile, like the... If they're a good way to purchase utility on current margins, then you should do them, even if we have reason to be to suspect that there's not very much gain to be had there. Um, but certainly, if you're like thinking about the Impossible Burger or something like that, one of the things that makes me feel optimistic is that I think that's like a structural change to 
how much carbon is produced by consumers doing typical American consumer things. And I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to need a bunch of those to address climate change and that this could be a meaningful one. Totally agree with that. Like, if you look at the amount of people, I, I posted in some like effective altruist, um, you know, uh, environmentalist things recently. Like, how many people carbon offset? And it's like almost no one did. And so, like, if if that's true, you know, within that group versus hey, actually allowing people to do what they normally do, which is eat meat tasting things and just do it at a big scale at Burger King, then that is going to be a lot better for reality. Um, good. So let's let's chat about AI for a quick second here. Um, and I specifically want to chat about something um, that you haven't written about yet, but we both are aware of, which is this cool article called The Hacker Learns to Trust, which was about this person, this kind of like hacker, undergraduate hacker, who was planning on releasing this um, uh, uh, open AI, made this um, language uh, learning model that was able to produce kind of in a a GAN way, uh, was able to produce text that looked super real. Um, And uh, they, when they said, hey, we can do this, they didn't release their full model initially. They released one um, with less parameters, essentially. And so this kid was like, hey, I'm going to release one that has the full parameter set, 1.5 billion. um, And, uh, and, but I won't do it. And I think it'll be better for society. And then after he said that, then he kind of went and like talked to folks and determined that like, maybe it wasn't as, you know, you know, wasn't actually the right idea. so could you kind of, and, and the thing I'm especially interested by here is this idea of, like, he was convinced by this idea of, like, shaping the norms for long-term AI safety. Um, so so what are your thoughts on on kind of this situation and and how he, and I guess you have some, so you, you, you were connected with folks at Miri and OpenAI. So what are your thoughts about um, this kind of big process and, and how we should think about norms in AI? Yeah, so I feel like the entire context in which OpenAI made the decisions they did around GPT-2 is very important here. So GPT-2 is a state-of-the-art language generator that uh, creates text um, based on what you input and then a very big corpus of text. It's pretty good. I've played it the full version and it makes uncannily realistic news articles for a couple paragraphs, although in later paragraphs the like internal structure tends to fall down a little bit. Um, it's one of, there have been a ton of state-of-the-art results in natural language processing in the last couple of years. This is, they did some cool new stuff that no one had done before, but there are lots of people doing cool new stuff no one had done before right now. Natural language processing is just hitting state-of-the-art, like, every month, I want to say. It, it, it's really impressive. So I think when OpenAI made the decision not to release GPT-2, a lot of people sort of saw it as, wow, they're claiming that this is much bigger and much more of a big deal than all of the state-of-the-art natural language systems that are coming out constantly. I don't think they were. I don't think they were saying this is different. I think they were saying, okay, at some point, We're going to have these systems that it's honestly a pretty bad idea to just put on the internet. And just like the security community sort of has norms about when you put put your cool exploit on the internet, maybe it's time that the natural language processing community also developed some norms about when you put your cool exploit on the internet. So they did announce that they were not releasing it, and then they announced a while later that they're releasing it in stages um, with smaller, less like sophisticated versions of the program first. Um, and at the same time, they're working with people on tools that can be used to counter it. You know, for example, tools that can be used to identify when a text was written by GPT-2, um, a better understanding of how GPT-2 could be misused for spam and misconduct. Um, So this is pretty controversial uh, that they chose not to publish it. I think because people took it as a claim that they'd done something special and people were rightfully like, they haven't done anything special. Like everybody's hitting some state of the arts and um, natural language processing these days. Um, But what, what they were aiming for certainly was at some point as a community, we need to make this transition. What if we started talking about it now? And I think that's a pretty good goal. Um, And I think uh, one of the, so, so then this, this kid, um, this, this young man re copy, figured out how to do something very similar to what they'd done, although it turned out that his system was significantly weaker. And that started the conversation again about, well, 
he, should he just go ahead and release it? Like, did open AI just have the ability to delay it until somebody replicated their work, which wasn't going to take very long? Um, or should we try and have a community that has norms where if somebody decides not to publish their research for safety reasons, even if you think that they were being too conservative or that there aren't real safety considerations, do we respect that as a community? Do we say, yep, I acknowledge that you should have the right to decide not to release your stuff right away for safety reasons. Even if I don't agree with the safety reasons, I'm not going to use that to scoop you. I'm going to sort of listen. And I think that's the conclusion that this hacker guy ended up reaching um, was that, yeah, we want a community where you can decide not to release. And even if people disagree with your decision not to release, they won't undermine it because we need to have that kind of community in order to eventually be responsible with much more powerful technologies, even if right now there's not that much at stake. Um, and I think you made the right call there. Yeah, yeah, I think that, and I think it just, for me, it, it really, um, I think a lot of people from the outside perspective, and even myself to some extent, um, see something like the AI safety community as, okay, when stuff gets released, what happens? And it's purely kind of like a code-based mindset. But in fact, there are all these norms around it, um, around what, what do we want the norms of the community to be like? Um, and, and really, really thinking about what those norms should look like as we go into the future, uh, I think is is crucial. I, I, one thing that I'm curious about, you, you talked about the, um, the tools to counter it um, and the kinds of ways that that we'll be able to you know if if something is power and something like gpt2 is found um could you tell me more about the kinds of things that might make it less uh harmful for society so i don't think everybody's got that all figured out and in fact i think one of the reasons they wanted to delay was to have more time for people to suggest ideas on that front to come up with potential solutions um it's very much i think in some respects an open problem um but for example a system that identifies GPT-2 text and flags it seems like a great thing to have. And improvement to spam filters that help spam filters identify GPT-2 generated text seems really important. Um, something that helps identify fake profiles on the internet using both GPT-2 um, detection and detection of fake faces and profile pictures, all of that seems like a useful thing to have. There, there's just a lot there that, um, we could be developing that would sort of slow the, the age of being unable to tell what's true and what's false on the internet and give us a couple more tools to cope with it as it comes. Yeah. Do you think I agree with all that? And maybe my final question here is how much a lot of those are code based solutions to a code based problem where you're like, OK, we will. It'll be like an arms race between people who are creating like evil GAN style things versus um, the protection against those. Like, can we determine if it's a deep fake? Can we determine if it's GPT-2 created or whatever? Also, how much do you think about the kind of upgrading human side <laughs> where we want humans to be able to to um yeah to to upgrade ourselves at, not from like a pure biotech perspective but also just from like a learning perspective maybe from a meditation perspective or something um as as we as the computers are, are getting more and more aggressive so i do believe that over time a new common sense develops that basically constitutes the meta community against whatever weird stuff is on the internet now like scams there's a bunch of classes of scams that mostly only target older people because <laughs> younger people are are wise to them and have been exposed to them enough that they're more ineffective. Um, there's a bunch of scams that were a thing for a while and are now no longer as much of a thing because people have learned how to respond appropriately. I do think that over time, societies develop common sense about what to do that is protective against a lot of kinds of abuse. The thing I worry about is that that takes a long time to develop. Um, it takes some trial and error, some people getting hurt, some people getting scammed out of their life savings. Uh, for the information to sort of be communicated. And also, I think there's like a, a bound on how much stuff can be included in common sense. I think you can't have common sense include everything. Um, so I think uh, if you ever are in a situation where human civilization succeeding requires like common sense to be too big and contain too much nuanced, detailed stuff, then, then I'm pretty worried. Um, and I, I worry that A, things are changing so fast that our processes for producing common sense or producing mimetic immunity to these problems, if you like, aren't keeping up. And then secondly, I'm worried that we are creating a society that is so complicated 
that we're going to need more of that than that we really have the capacity to transmit at high fidelity to one another and remember and act on. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I agree with your worry and skepticism, and I really like the, the term uh, mimetic immunity. Um, so with that, uh, Kelsey, thanks so much for um, coming on the show today. Do you have where should people find you and or Vox on the interwebs? Uh, yeah, so Future Perfect is uh, on Vox, vox.com slash Future Perfect. I'm on Twitter at Kelsey Tuak, and I'm Tumblr at the Internet of Caring. Um, and you can always shoot me an email at Kelsey Piper at vox.com uh, about anything I've written that you think uh, I got wrong or got right, um, or just asking for thoughts on effective altruist questions and Future Perfect questions that are important to you. Uh, it might be slow to reply, but I really do try to get back to everyone. Boom. Great. That's awesome. Well, thank you for that uh, welcomingness. And again, thank you for coming on today.